Hey guys, Dave here. So recently a fan of the channel, Addy Godoli, messaged me and said, hey Dave, get down to Brisbane and do a Blue Tongue Skink episode with Joe Ball. So that's exactly what I did. I'm here in Brisbane and I'm about to go spend the afternoon with Joe Ball and check out some of his amazing blue tongue skink morphs. So because of the import and export laws here in Australia, Australian herpers were confined to working with only Australian species and therefore they were kind of decades behind the rest of the world as far as herpticulture and the morphs that they can produce in captivity. But with blue tongue skinks, they are decades ahead of the rest of the world with the morphs that they're producing. So Joe keeps so much more than blue tongue skinks though, and if you want to see more on that, go check out my vlog channel. The uh, link is in the description below, so check that out as well. But for now, let's go check out Joe Ball's amazing blue tongue skink morph. So, Addy, this episode is for you here on Zilla Presents Herpers TV episodes. I'm a herper, herper, herper. I'm a herper, I'm a herper. Hi guys, my name is Joe Ball and I'm owner at bluetonguelizard.com. I'm an English guy originally and I've been living in Australia for what, sort of 13, 14 years now and I've been fortunate enough to, be, to have been breeding blue tongues for the major part of that. I've been keeping reptiles since I was probably about five or six. I've always loved everything with scales, whether it's a snake, a lizard or even frogs, uh, even fish. And um, I'm fortunate enough today to be telling you a little bit about what I've done with blue tongues here in Australia. Okay, so here we've got albino blue tongues. Now, albinism is the cornerstone of any mutation program, and without albinism, in my opinion, you've got nothing. These guys were found originally in New South Wales, so they're an eastern blue tongue, and they were proven out by the guys at Snake Ranch. And since then, I've taken on those animals and done some outcrossing with them. Uh, these guys here have actually got some northern blue tongue blood in them which actually for me gives them a little bit more vigor, a little bit more color and um, has actually made them easier to replicate because of that vigor. Right, so here is what we call a white northern. And this is a mutation that was found by John Robert Coward up in the Northern Territory. And this guy turns out to be another recessive mutation. And there's a little bit of conjecture about what these guys should be named because they take on, if you like, a bit of a leukistic appearance, but technically are not. So what we've ended up landing on is basically just a white northern because that's what they are. And as you agree when you look at them, they are sensational. So the naming of these guys causes quite a stir. The original guy, when he bred them, just called them whites or white northerns. Since then, they've taken on a few other names. You've got some people sticking to the name White Northern, some people calling them hypo, and some people saying that they're leukistic. And to me, they are clinically leukistic, but there is a few people out there that object and say that technically they aren't leukistic. And the reason why is because some of them are absolutely flash white like this, but others of them have quite a bit of color through them. So technically some of them are and some of them aren't. So it does cause a bit of a, bit of a stir. I like to sit on the fence and I like to stick with the name that the original breeder put on these, which is White Northern. And I believe personally that in the reptile game, the originator holds the cards. So for me, these are White Northerns. Okay, so here we have a mutation that I was fortunate enough to find and prove out right here. And what we have is what I call the black-eyed anery. And an anery means the zero presence of orange. And this is, again, a, a recessive mutation. Why I call it anery as opposed to example is that there is a little bit of yellow on some of the specimens. So that's what you have there. And here you have the black eyes, the jet black eyes, which, as you can see, there's zero orange present in those, which is typical of a normal blue tongue. So here we have, which is for me, the most exciting and latest and greatest blue tongue morph. This is the T plus albino northern blue tongue. And the first ones of these guys were bred by a guy called Dave Mitchell up in Rockhampton. And he was popping these guys out in a pit full of northerns that he had randomly. And he, he sort of was seeing it happen and didn't really understand what was going on. So when I went up to see Dave, I had a look through this pit and you could see 
some really dark normal looking northerns and you could see a very small percentage of them which look like this guy and to me that screamed like a mutation so what I did was I grabbed a few of these off Dave and put a few years work into them and outbred them and this year we have the first ones of these which prove that again it's Mendelian recessive and it gives another mutation for blue tongue breeders to work with and with the unreal lavenders and yellows that are through this animal you can see that it really is set to rival the existing albino T negative and really set the pulses racing amongst the blue tongue world. So here we have what is basically the jealousy of the world. This is the hypermelanistic blue tongue. Now, Everybody wants these guys, whether it's it's in Australia or whether it's around the world. The, the, the requests I get for these animals would be in double figures every week. So even here in Australia where these guys are now at sort of the $500 mark, I've sold out of these within the first few weeks of having bred them, which is only once a year. Now, this is an incomplete dominant mutation. You've got visual hats and the super form is these guys, which is literally jet black. And you can see just by looking at them why everybody wants them. The origin of these guys is from New South Wales. There was an individual animal that was found by, I believe, Dr. Rick Shine, and he passed it on to Peter Harlow, who then in turn proved these animals out with the help of Snake Ranch, and they're now, as you see them, in the hobby today. Okay, so here we have another mutation that I, I found myself and I found these guys in a Brisbane pet shop, believe it or not, and paid 30 or 40 bucks each for a, for a couple that I found. I thought, and the reason why I bought them was because you, you can see this crazed patterning on the back of the animal. And at the time, there was no real pattern mutations in blue tongues. There was only a couple of color mutations. And so what I did with these guys is I took them home, I paired them to each other and produced a full litter of them, which made me think, oh, maybe that is genetic. I then paired it to a normal and I got a full litter of normals which made me think, yep, yeah, that really could be genetic. And then when I paired the normals together, which um, the so-called hets, if you like, I got my one in four visuals out of that which proved it out to be another recessive mutation. How I see these guys is these are a bit of an entry level morph. They don't go for the big bucks of say an albino, but what they do is give some of the, the the younger guys and the guys with less dollars to spend uh, an opportunity to get into mutation blow tongues. And over the top, which hasn't yet been explored, is the opportunity to pair these to albino or to any of the other mutations to create reduced pattern animals. So reduced pattern double genetic combos. Okay, so what I wanna just quickly look at now is a few of the combinations that have resulted from the mutations that we've just looked at. And this guy firstly is a snow. This is a combination of the black eyed anery and the albino. So, okay, so this particular combination is, is one that I've done myself. I indeed found the anery gene and I used the snake ranch albino gene, put those together and produced which is right here, the first snow blue tongue. Okay, so this is the ultimate blue tongue. This is the lava. We've already covered albinism and we've also covered the hypermelanistic blueies. And what this guy is, this is the elusive double representation of both those genetics. And what I did with these guys is I paired my albino to my hypermelanistic, I made the double hats, and these guys are the one in 16 result of pairing those double hats. And as you can see, as is true with all albinos, you've got zero black. And in this case, you've got masses and masses of orange pigment. And these guys, really are off the chart and these are what everybody's trying to make down here in Australia. This is a really interesting animal and this is close to being my favorite double genetic animal. It's pretty close, when I'm looking at it, I'm thinking it almost is, but anyway. Um, you've got here a white northern and it's it was produced by Karen Russell in Sydney and she paired the white northern with the black eyed anery. And so what the result was is you've got the brilliant white animal, but you also got the jet black eyes. So as we discussed earlier, 
the white animal is clinically leukistic. And then when you add the black eyes to it, you then get this unreal animal that to me is completely comparable to the black eyed leukistic ball python. And whilst technically it's not the same, visually it really is absolutely the same. And to me, this is the ultimate white lizard. Okay, so what I've got here is I've got a Darwin Northern in my left hand and I've got a Kimberly Northern in my right hand. And these have exactly the same species name, but they both have wild ranges in their color forms. You've got sort of a much darker animal here with a few toffees and yellows. And with these guys, you have a very peppered appearance and some of them are an extreme high yellow. The Kimberly that I've got here is actually an exanthic form. So whilst it doesn't show the yellows and oranges that you've got in the Kimberleys, what it does is show the peppering that, that it creates and a zigzag through the pattern. And this, this guy here, the Kimberly, is what I've used in creating some of my morphs. And that is, in my mind, to enhance some of the morphs. It adds and infuses extra color and extra vigor. And I suppose for, for, for you guys over there in the States, this is comparable to your inchy ball pythons in the sense that the color prism that those guys bring to the table in a locality sense enable a whole new book to be written, if you like, on every single morph as it's used. Okay, so the basic cycle of a blue tongue is that obviously through the summer months it's in, it's in full full swing, this guy eats from the months of summer down here, which is September right the way through till the end of April. Then at the end of April, as the nighttime temperatures start to drop, their interest in food will start to wane. And at this point, I'll take the food away. I'll, I'll indeed even switch any heat off that I've got and, and basically cool the animal for the next couple of months. Then I'll slowly start to introduce the heat and then these animals will generally go into a shed, especially the male. And then in sort of July, they'll start their mating cycle. And I'll introduce males individually in these tubs and put them with the females and mate these females probably twice, maybe three times. And then I'll then introduce food again, pick up the heat, the females uh, digestion will kick in, she'll start eating. You're looking at a gestation cycle of around 100 and two days, something like that. And then she'll give live birth to probably, say in an average litter, six to 12 babies. Okay, so now we're gonna look at my outdoor enclosures and we're gonna talk through how I set them up and my theory behind how they work. Okay, so keeping blue tongues outside can be a challenge, especially in extremes of heat and extremes of cold and uh, in Queensland here, extreme rainfall at times. So you've got to cover for all those eventualities. You can actually give the cages below uh, protection from the heat. So you've got the heat coming down and this actually reflects the heat and then keeps this area below at normal shade temperature. And then as temperatures drop and you get to more manageable temperatures sort of in the high 20s, you can have these tops flip back. Then when we get to the cage itself, we've got two sections. The front section here, which has a, a carpet substrate, if you like. And in that, you've got a food bowl, which I have dried food, and each week I also put a, a wet food mix in there too. So that's the staple, and then there's a wet food that goes in once a week also. And then you go into the back section of this, of this cage here, which can be accessed through this little pigeonhole. And there's again a piece of carpet in the back, and then your animal sort of sits in there and can, um, so it feels nice and safe like any reptile need, needs to feel, needs to feel nice and safe and can get out of the heat and um, yeah, find some refuge. Okay, so what we've got here is what I've uh, called a, a pinstriped or a super pinstriped blotch blue tongue. And this guy is an alpine blotch blue tongue, which you'd find in the alpine region of New South Wales. I had an individual animal given to me like this, which had a, um, a reduced pattern to it. And if you like a, a partial striping, 
and I thought that's going to be pretty cool to see if I can't join these stripes together and do maybe a, a polygenic um, striping project across these alpine blotches and lo and behold one of these came out which was a massive step from the original animal and that screamed genetic to me. Yeah so the name of this mutation is super pinstriped. These are the only ones of these that exist and represent the first proven genetic mutation in blotch blue tongues. So the next step for the colour morph blue tongue, yeah sure it's pretty progressive here in Australia we've got heaps of single gene animals, we've got double genes, we've taken a look at the first triple gene animal but for me for these animals to progress the law needs to take a good look at itself and allow some of the prohibition if you like that exists on, on Australian reptiles and make some allowances for captive bred animals and for me that needs to change with blue tongues. You've got You've got people asking me every day, every week, countless questions, how can we get these animals overseas? So if the laws are looking at this, guys, you need to relax. You need to let some of these laws change and you need to get some of these animals from Australia into the hands of enthusiasts all around the world and let, let's benefit from it, you know? So blue tongues have come a long way in Australia. They've come from locality specific animals to the to finding the first albino to now looking at double and triple genetic animals and the future for blue tongues is massive you know it's still massive here in australia there's still so much growth there with heaps of breeders every year sort of jumping sides if you like from snakes into lizards and taking on this whole blue tongue rush and not only that the history of blue tongues or that the future of blue tongues is going to go mainstream it's going to end up overseas and it's really going to rival ball pythons for all the different mutations that there are and combination genetics that will result from there so i'm fortunate enough to have been one of the guys that's really kicked this off uh, i hope to take it to the bitter end but i hope that there's others that are going to run with it too <laughs>